So President Cyril Ramaphosa recently signed the NHI bill into law, and there have been a variety of reactions around, is this a good idea? Is universal health care a good idea? Is the ANC the right actor for this? Is this just a campaign event? And I thought, who's the best person to speak to about this? We need to speak to somebody who is a doctor, somebody who has studied public health, somebody who has worked in public health, and somebody who has an understanding of how to run an administration at a particular level, and also somebody who's worked in healthcare at various degrees. And there's no better South African, in my opinion, than Dr. Mpo Palatze. So I reached out to her and I said, hey, do you want to have a conversation about this? And she graciously said yes, and I'm so grateful that you did. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jamie. Lovely to have you host me on this very important topic that everybody is talking about. Yeah. So let's dive in. I saw a picture of you and you looked like you were fuming <laughs> at a public hearing and uh, you did not look happy at all. And it was an NHI public hearing. So what do you think about the idea of universal healthcare and what have been your experiences in the, and maybe tell South Africans, because they may not know your medical background and everything that you've done for, I think you were at a clinic at a certain point. And so, so just tell South Africans, I can't tell that story with, and do it justice. All right. Thanks, Jamie. Hello, everybody. Um, you all know me as the former mayor of Johannesburg, but I'm actually a medical doctor by profession. That's mm. what I trained to do. Um, I qualified in 2005, did my internship at Tembisa Hospital, it was yeah. the second busiest hospital in the Southern Hemisphere of yeah. the era. Um, did my community service here at Jubilee Hospital in Hammondskraal, did a bit of rural medicine there. Mm. You serviced clinics in a lot of the villages in and around Hammondskraal, Tadi Kadi, Homu, Mm -hmm. all those mm. areas I loved it so we did a bit of family medicine there and then I went on to work for a few mining houses um, mm. I worked for Anglo Platinum it was the first one that I worked for Yeah, I was very much interested in looking at different service delivery models so mm. I was always curious to see yeah. how different sectors were doing it yeah. the private sector versus the, the, the public sector mm. but also within the private sector you've got different uh, permutations of yeah. implementation if you look at mining versus your private hospital groups, mm. other private hospital groups. So I was very much interested and curious about that. Yeah. So I spent a bit of time. Um, I did a bit of locum work as well mm. with um, Lonmen, with Exarocol, went into GP practice mm. a bit in Potschiffstrom, um, did a bit of casualty work in various areas, including Fenter Store. Yeah. So I've been around. Uh, yeah. um, and I have worked also in, in, in private healthcare and I'm back in private healthcare yeah. now after my seven year stint yeah. in politics. Um, so I've been exposed to most of the the, the private hospital groups, Netcare, yeah. Life, MediClinic, where I've done work in the surgical space, which yeah. is what I'm doing currently. So I'd say um, my my um, experience is quite vast. But that, you missed you missed. Did you talk about the public health side? Okay, so that's you need, me. You need that's to let me them as know. a clinician. You as a clinician. That, that was me as a clinician. But I've also done non clinical work as a doctor. Yeah. And um, and even in that space, I've done different things. So. I spent four years at WITS yeah. studying public health medicine, public yeah. health medicine. And what is that about? Because you need to tell them yeah. what is what does it mean to study public health medicine? Okay, so so as a medical doctor, you choose to specialize in in any one of various fields. Yeah. Most of the clinical the 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 fields you can specialize in are clinical, yeah. but you also have a non clinical field of public health medicine, which is public administration focusing yeah. on health care. Now, all the time that I spent in politics, my my three years as an MMC, and the time I spent in mayor, I was actually practicing public health. Yeah. Because if you look at the World Health Organization definition of health, it goes beyond just the health system. Yeah. It looks at social determinants of health, and the yeah. WHO has what they call the health in all policy approach, mm -hmm. which looks at um, access to proper housing, access to clean running mm -hmm. water, proper sanitation, clean energy, employment. Mm -hmm. All those are social determinants of health. Yeah. Why? Because the impact on health yeah. outcomes at the end of the day. And often governments focus on hospitals, clinics, and we're not as preventative as we ought to be. And that's yeah. why we fail and we carry the burden of disease that we end up carrying. So that was always my interest. But that interest was sparked. Um, while I was doing work. So I got two contracts with mm. SASA in Gauteng and in the Northwest province doing yeah. disability assessments. And while I was in the Northwest 
in, in very poor areas, mm. very underdeveloped areas like Khanyesa, I got very concerned because a lot of the applicants brought their, their hospital files with yeah. them and I'd peruse these files and then a lot of them, uncontrolled diabetes, mm. uncontrolled hypertension, people missing appointments, not getting their treatments for various reasons. Mm. Um, for instance, I'm unemployed. I don't have money for transport. I'm not eating well. I don't mm. have access to proper nutrition and so on and so forth. Or there's just no medication or whatever the case may be. But that for me gave me a, a closer look into how government was doing. Yeah. Because I was then a private provider of a service, yeah. service in government, and I saw the government was failing mm. to take care of these people. But it wasn't just the health system that was yeah. failing. It was all the, the 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 portfolio that were failing to operate together to to service the one person. Mm. I saw a lot of fragmentation. Um, I saw that there were a lot of solutions, but they were not connected and they mm. were difficult to navigate. And, and and I was interested in learning how to work in such a complex environment. And that's yeah. what sparked my interest to go and study public health medicine. Mm. Um, I mean, even in my interview at WITS, I spoke about how my interest was intersectoral collaboration. I spent about a year of my time at WITS in Ekureleni, six months of which I spent following the IDP process, the Integrated yeah. Development Planning process, because I thought that is potentially one platform that could be used to start to integrate mm. planning across departments because a lot of times um, at a at an institutional level, for instance, in the city of Joburg when I was there, mm. uh, we talk about IDPs, but the integration is is only theoretical. Yeah. It's not really practical. And in my time and uh, in the city, we were starting to work with the planning department at a central location at at having more transversal approaches yeah. to, the, to the planning, to the monitoring and evaluation and so on because that's where you have real integration. So that was my time um, in, in public health. Of course, the four years at WITS uh, means you are immersed in, yeah. in services. So and, and at some point, I was working with the Provincial Department of Health. Yeah. Yeah. When um, former MEC Kodani was there, yeah. um, project managed a project there um, where we looked at theater efficiency. So we did a, I did a process flow study in mm. theater to look at blockages. Um, did, we did a lot of interesting things. I, I spent some time at the National Institute for Communicable Diseases, yeah. some time at the National Institute for Occupational Health, um, some time at Barra, at Charlotte McClaken, um, various uh, spaces where yeah. I grew my competencies in the public health arena. Okay, and now that we've done you as a clinician, we've we've done you as a public health expert, you then occupy a role of leadership in the city of Johannesburg. So can you tell us a little bit about that, how you came to be in that role and then what you did in that role? Because it was MMC, right? Right. For health, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was working, so after my four years at WITS, actually I hadn't done my exams because yeah. I wanted to do more rotations and there was a very exciting rotation. So it was actually implementing health information system. Yeah. So Tia.net is a system that takes um, paper-based data, um, HIV, TB data onto an electronic health record system. Yeah. And um, and I wanted to project manage that and yeah. learn about health information systems. And so I'd, I'd, I ended up not doing my exams by mm. the time my four years was up. Yeah. And and so I had to work because I lost the post because another registrar had to come in. Yeah. I, I accepted that I'm going to write from outside yeah. of the system. And my first job was at Alex Clinic, mm. casualty officer. Now, Alex, you know, very impoverished, um, the poorest urban mm. area, probably Johannesburg. And, um, you know, that if, if you go to Alexandria, you get a sense of what poverty really looks mm. like, urban poverty in, in South Africa. And I was very disturbed. Um, yeah. There was a lot of violence, a lot of aggression. Uh, we saw a lot of bloodshed on a daily basis. We heard gunshots literally mm. a stone's throw away from the clinic and you yeah. start preparing for those patients because you know they're coming. Yeah. And and I was so disturbed as to the levels of violence and aggression. Mm. And to me, it spoke of frustration. And yeah. if you drive around Alexandra, you begin to understand where some of that frustration comes from. Comes of course, from. I interviewed a lot of my patients as well about their lived experiences. And many of them shared horrific stories. Yeah. And um, and I got angry. I got angry at government. Um, I felt that government was sleeping on their job um, in providing services to these people. Yeah. I started writing to various people, including um, a a former colleague of mine and a dear brother and friend, uh, Dr. Heinrich Walming, mm -hmm. who really was instrumental in introducing me to politics and particularly the Democratic Alliance. Yeah. Uh, we had been in the same cohort as registrars. Mm. And, um, 
I wrote to him, he was then a member of parliament. Yeah. So he had started before me and he was already out of the system. And I said to him, what, what, what is government doing? What are you guys doing there yeah. in parliament? Why are you allowing people to live like this? Yeah. Um, and, and he challenged me. He said, well, why don't you do something about it? Have mm. you ever considered becoming a counselor? You can be a voice, you know, for the people of Alexandra, drive their issues. Mm. And that's how I agreed to apply. Initially, it wasn't supposed to be a full-time thing because yeah. he said you do have the option of becoming a PR counselor and you can still continue with yeah. the other plans. And at that point, I was already setting up to go back into disability yeah. practice with a focus on the road accident fund. Um, and and so I applied and I, I went through the DA's internal processes. And when Herman Mashava was elected mayor, he then announced me as the MNC for health. Oh, wow. Which then became a full-time role, mm. and I let go of everything, and I focused on that. I must say it was very productive mm. um, in the healthcare space. Yeah. I was given two departments, mm. which I'm very grateful for, because those two departments should also be integrated. Yeah, which right? ones? It, so it, it was health and social development. Ah, okay. Now, I remember when I was when I was in Alex one night, I had a diabetic, and I've shared the story many times. It was a lady whose sugar was uncontrolled, and I kept her there on a drip um, to try and get her sugar down. Um, and around 1, 2 a.m., she was stabilized, mm. but we had changed her treatment regime. So mm. I needed her to stay and wait for the pharmacy to open so she yeah. could get her new treatment. So I said to her, Ma, can you ask somebody at home to bring you food? Yeah. You know, so that you can eat, um, because you, I need you to stay here. Yeah. This is a clinic. I mean, clinics don't serve food or yeah. hospitals do. So she said to me, there's nobody who can bring me food. There's no food at home. And I said, Mom, when last did you eat? And she, I think she said it happened two days. And I said, no wonder you're uncontrolled. Mm. Now, this is where. I got angry. So I asked, right, um, the, the the nursing staff, is there a social worker at the clinic? And I think mm. they said they only come once a week or something to that effect. So it wasn't even a, a yeah. permanent social worker. And I said, well, is there any way of helping somebody who does not have food? And nothing they said to me, there is nothing, right? And can I tell you that, in, for instance, in the city of Johannesburg, there's a whole department of social development, yeah. social workers. They've got separate offices, clinics yeah. are separate. Um, of course, we changed that when when I became MNC. We mm. started integrating, bringing social workers into clinics. I yeah. don't know where it is now. But um, there are so many programs within social development. You've got a food bank, for instance, mm. that people can access by registering on the city's indigent register. Mm. So what we started doing at that time is I started um, introducing um, um, indigent registers or ESP registration, yeah. which is the expanded social package, yeah. which is basically what you get when you register on the indigent database. Yeah. And we started introducing of registration at clinics so mm-hmm. that to make it more accessible. Yeah. We started bringing social workers into clinics. We made them permanent in clinics so you could act as a social worker at any time. We established referral pathways mm. between the nurses, the doctors, and the social workers so we could address, begin to address the social de- de- yeah. demands of health. Now, in Alexandra, we did something very interesting uh, where we collaborated with the World Health Organization. In mm. fact, we were going to, when, when we were ousted, I, I think Herman resigned in November, and I remember my last meeting with the World Health Organization was around October, yeah. just before he resigned. And we were talking about, in fact, it was November, I think it was the same thing. And we were talking about them coming and erecting a plug at uh, River Park Clinic in mm. Alex to declare the city of Johannesburg, a WHO collaboration center on health in all policy. Mm. Because we were running a pilot project in Alexandra with through the regional services system of the city yeah. we were beginning to integrate services. Oh, yeah. So the regional director was party to this and all the various um, service points, whether it's job of water, city power, uh, whatever the case may be in Alexandria, mm. in the region at large, were part of this project and we were going to begin to address um, social determinants of health. Um, we also did a study with Northern Waters mm. uh, on diabetes. Mm. Uh, we partnered with Wits University, the University of Johannesburg, um, UP, and mm. so on. And uh, we actually had a resident specialist, Professor Jet Wing, who mm. started seeing patients. For the first time, we had a specialist at a clinic in Alexandria. Wow. 
and an endocrinologist who yeah. is seeing patients with diabetes yeah. instead of referring them out yeah. to Charlotte but like, or whatever the case may be because that adds steps to them. yeah exactly but um, so the study that we did with Nova Nordisk actually revealed a few things um, the associated risk factors mm. um, obesity and overweight and we mm-hmm. saw that a lot of our members of our population were either overweight or obese but what was said is that a lot of them had no way of managing no mm-hmm. problem. Um, you know, the affluent, many people uh, have um, medical aids, yeah. one, but they also have gym memberships, yeah. as an example, and various other things they could do mm-hmm. to lose weight, to stay active. Mm-hmm. Whereas um, Some of them are not... buying for Zimpic. Apparently, this is the thing. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we can talk about Ozempic. But, um, but. But I saw that these people in Alex didn't have ways to lose mm. weight. So we started bringing, and we partnered with community development, with sports and rec in particular. We started doing aerobics at the yeah. clinic uh, just to bring exercise close yeah. to the people for free. Uh, and we were working on other partnerships with mm. nutritionists and so on. So the program was taking shape beautifully. Yeah. But it was really about bringing services close to the people, close to the people. addressing their health issues, but also just making it affordable, accessible, yeah. making it fun and, and and not so much of a burden on the health system. And I say this to say there are ways to resolve a burden of disease, mm. a creative way to resolve the lack of access to, yeah. to services, to health care. Uh, one of the things we did, for instance, to address access is increasing hours of service in our clinic. Mm. So we increased the hours of service in the city's clinic. Uh, of course, we did it incrementally because of budget consideration. Mm. As you know, primary health care is not a primary local government function. Mm. So we would receive a subsidy from the provincial department mm. of health. Of course, we subsidized the function a lot, but yeah. we spent more on it than than even the key mandate holder. But we then decided to increase the hours of service and, and then we had to fund that ourselves. Yeah. So we had our clinics open so late, I think the latest was 10 o'clock at night. Yeah. We started opening on weekends and on public holidays. And like I said, we did it incrementally and we had different permutations mm. in the various service sites depending on demand. Uh, that was one thing we did to improve access. The yeah. other thing we did to improve access, and this was in response to um, an EFF-sponsored motion, and I must give credit. Yeah. You know, they came with the motion in council. We thought it was a brilliant idea. We supported it. Yeah. And I led the implementation of the first mobile clinic services in the city. Mm. to reach underserved areas. Yeah. Um, our first one was actually a, a donation by PPC Cement in mm-hmm. Region A as part of their social labor plan, mm. responsibility rights. And, and and they said it has to be in Region A around Deep Slurt, close to their operations. So that was great. It was the first one. And then we rolled out another 10 yeah. using the city's budget. Beautiful, long, big trucks with everything inside that yeah. you need to render primary health care. And we, we were able to, to offer most and maybe explain to people the differences because some people don't even know what is primary health care. So maybe explain people who haven't done fundamentals of health and disease. Okay, so you've got different levels of care mm. depending on what you present with. But the first point of contact for anybody with mm. the health system should be primary health care. Mm-hmm. Unless, of course, you've got a, a serious emergency yeah. right, where you picked up an ambulance and then they would triage you. Yeah. In other words, they would do an assessment and say, this is a um, this kind of priority patient. Mm. And then based on that, they will decide where to take you. But if, you, if you've got a headache, you've got a backache, you've got a running tummy, whatever the case mm-hmm. may be, you really ought to access your clinic. That's, mm-hmm. that's the primary health care level. And most of our clinics in Johannesburg as an example, um, are run by nurses. Mm. Uh, we've got primary health care trained nurses, which mm-hmm. are specialists in yeah. primary health care. They can do most things at mm-hmm. a primary level. Yeah. Um, but there's also the option to refer to a doctor. Yeah. You've heard me speak earlier about when I was in the Hamas Grawl doing my community service, mm-hmm. um, we serviced clinics. Yeah. So even in Johannesburg, um, at the time I was in MC, we had two doctors per per region mm-hmm. servicing all the things in the region which yeah. means they would rotate so you wouldn't have a so doctor. what does that look like on a day-to-day basis so you would enter you would enter the clinic you'd be seen by a nurse um I'm not going to go through the triage and all of yeah. that too long, but you ultimately get to a nurse. The nurse sees you, and if the nurse feels they can't manage this, they yeah. refer you to a doctor. Mm-hmm. And if the doctor feels this cannot be managed at a primary level, mm. um, then they would refer you. We could refer you to either Chris Hanibar Wanath or Helen Joseph or even um, Edenvale, depending on the location and the various referral pathways. Mm-hmm. They also 
depending on what you're presenting with mm. and where you can get help. Mm -hmm. So so that's the kind of system that we had. It worked well. The only thing we were trying to change, and we were still in talks with the Provincial Department of Health, was to increase hours of service further to 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 make some city clinics 24-hour clinics. So mm. we wanted to be able to run casualty services as well as midwife obstetric units. Yeah. Um, much like your Hillbrook Clinic, your mm -hmm. Alexandra Clinic, Zola, you mm -hmm. know, you've got a few. They're called community health centers, so mm -hmm. they're bigger clinics and they, they operate 24 hours. They've got a casualty. And yeah. you've got a, you, you could deliver babies. Yeah. Um, and that's what we wanted to introduce. Of course, there was resistance um, from the province. It was at the time, MEC Bantele Masuka was in office, mm -hmm. and we really tried to push to get. So, wait, the, the ANC administration pushed back. Yeah. On this, yeah. and why? Why did they push back? Unfortunately, there's politics even in healthcare. Mm -hmm. Healthcare is a people's people facing service. Yeah. Um, and so it, it tends to be politicized a lot. What happened was, so we saw that the clinic, the city was building more and more clinics. Yeah. And we were building bigger and bigger, right? Bigger, better, state of the art facilities. Yeah. I mean, some of the facilities won um, international awards and yeah. so on. And and we felt that we were underutilizing these mm. spaces and there was a growing demand, particularly in areas that were underserved. Yeah. Were areas like, for instance, in, um, in Ivory Park as, yeah. as an example, where the provincial government had been promising um, mm -hmm. to build um, a hospital or a clinic, a bigger clinic for a long time, but they had no funding to mm. do so. Now, at a district level, now the district is a convergence of the mm -hmm. city and the province. Mm. And we had district uh, body that worked together to manage healthcare in the district. And we also had that, have, had a a, a provincial health council that was chaired by the MEC, which was a meeting of the MEC with all the MECs mm -hmm. in the different municipalities. So that's also at a district level. And then you also had your district clinical specialist teams. You had your your administrators at a, at, a, at a district level looking at healthcare. Now, that's where also planning uh. happened. And where province was planning to establish a facility, the city would not uh. establish a facility. So we also um, looked to er take away duplication of services so that our budgets go further. Uh. Uh, but in spite of that, we found that the province would often say we're building here and they wouldn't have the money to do uh. it and they'd keep postponing and postponing. And at the same time, the city was building. And, and so we started to have the conversation to say, hey, give us that. That, that other function that you would help yeah. when you delegated the healthcare yeah. to us, give us the running of casualties, give us the running of midwife obstetric units, allow some of our clinics mm. to open for 24 hours, and there was a pushback. The first clinic was Ebony Park Clinic. Yeah. Um, we actually got ambushed by community members who, I believe, were mobilized politically. For real? Yes. Um, we were we were ousted just before it got open, but the opening itself was delayed by the politics around it, because there was now this contestation between the city and the province, mm. who's going to run it. But you know, for me, it doesn't make sense. Firstly, you're the key mandate holder. You're not investing yeah. in the service. You're not building. The city takes from its budget. They build, and then you want to hijack, hijack take them. over, yeah. and that's what was happening. And we were saying, "Come and handhold us, yeah, and 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 usher us into this yeah. new service." We had the human resources. In fact, our clinics were better run than provincial yeah. clinics, um, and we just wanted to get into twenty-four hour services, casualties, services, yeah. and MOU. And and there was just resistance to do that. In fact, um, I went to the opening. I was an opposition council at the time. Yeah. And I sat there and I listened to then NEC Van Le talk mm. about how the city was going to donate buildings to the province. Mm. Yeah, the buildings these, that the city built yeah, to the province. Yes. Some of these. But the, mind you, the province is the key mandate holder. Yeah. So they're the ones receiving the, the budget. Yeah. A budget which we also queried because there was no transparency as to the formula mm. that was used to determine who got how much. Yeah, and we felt that as the city of Johannesburg, we we were being undercut by the yeah. and we had raised it, and there was a, a task team that was put together. Um, I think it was in the time of Dr. Gwen Ramakhopa, mm -hmm. and um, and they were supposed to look at defining very clearly for everyone how they came to those amounts mm -hmm. and and the various metrics that were used. Mm -hmm. uh, we argued that we were a hub for in-migration because of the nature of healthcare, you can't discriminate. So for yeah. example, you've got an outbreak. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, for instance, during COVID, yeah. we can't say we're only treating people with South African ID. Mm. Because if you don't treat somebody out, then everyone else is at risk. Yeah. And uh, we've got HIV, we've got TD, so many communicable diseases. And because of that, um, we 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 felt as Johannesburg that we were grossly underfunded because mm. a lot of our population was un, un undocumented. Mm. And therefore unaccounted for. So so those were some of the discussions that were happening, of course, until we were asked as um, none of that stuff was revoked. Hmm. It's a lot. It's a lot. And I want to ask you now, what are your reflections and thoughts and opinions on this NHI, National Health Insurance? Because I saw the picture. I'm going to post the picture so that the people can see it. What do you think about this move? I think it's a scam. Um, I agree it's a scam. It's the biggest lie to the poorest of the poor um, who genuinely desire better health services. Um, they've been sold false hope. Why? Why do you think so? Election. Why do you think the, the bill got signed when it got signed? Two weeks before an election. But where do they get the votes? Do you think that they can go to the rural areas and the townships and then say that you've got... NHI so vote for us? Well, we've heard some electioneering around NHI already, even before the bill was signed. Um, so it is typically an electioneering tool. And and it's sad. And for me, as a medical professional, it makes me angry. Mm. It makes me angry because universal health coverage is a real need. Um if we look at legislation, mm. right? And if we look at let's let's go back a bit to where this idea of universal health coverage started emerging, particularly in our local context. Mm. Um, and I want to go as far back as the Freedom Charter. Go, go as far as you want, yeah. And and the Freedom Charter promises that if if you look at it, because what is universal health coverage? The, mm. the World Health Organization defines it very simply as everybody accessing um, or the full range of health services that they need mm. when they need it, where they need it and with financial risk protection. Mm. So anything that says that all people have the right to access, for instance, Section 27 of our Constitution, mm. it's already talking universal health coverage. Mm. All people have a right to access um, health services and that government must do everything in its power to towards the progressive realization mm. of that ideal. Mm. So so whether you're looking at the, the Freedom Charter, which then was translated into Section 27 of the Constitution, you look at the National Health Act, this has always been in place. Mm. Nothing new. It's nothing new that we're suddenly thinking, oh, now we want you. But that's what, that's what they're saying. That's what they're saying. They're saying it's not new. The, the policy is old in terms of the ideas. So why are people panicking? No. Okay. And let's 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 again go globally. Um, we we are a United Nation um a member state mm. in South Africa, and we're signatories to the UN Sustainable Development Goal. Mm. And again, the universal coverage. So mm. it's not only a local thing; it's also a global. That's what Cyril said in his speech. He said, right. "Why are you guys panicking? We're going with the world." <laughs> That's what he said. He said, this is not just a Mickey my, Mouse so idea. My question to, to our government in the 30 years of democracy is why have we not implemented something that we were meant to implement mm -hmm. already um, 30 years ago when mm -hmm. we took over government? Oh, why did it not happen? And I believe that we are not correctly diagnosing the problems why they were not so so let's let's go to the diagnosis yeah. what is your diagnosis of our system okay sure so why did i leave public service to join politics i was mm. frustrated as a mm. clinician you're hot for yes um i spoke about social determinants and yeah. i spoke about the lived experiences of the people of alex but over and above that let's go inside the clinic mm. I want to help a patient. I need supplies. Mm. More often than not, I would not have the supply that I need. Why? Because someone didn't do their job or there was corruption. Someone got paid. They didn't deliver. But most public health facilities in South Africa operate without the requisite supplies, even the requisite skills. You would have seen the march, the unemployed doctor march mm. recently, um, young doctors saying, give us jobs. You know, and 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 I I had the privilege. I now work with the person who organized the march. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and she's a post com service doctor, mm -hmm. Doctor Nell Maguna, and 
and we had a chat about what that was all about. Mm. And and they were not being unreasonable. They were saying there are posts, there are vacant posts. These posts are unfunded. Mm. They're unfunded. Um, government is simply not putting the money into those services, and that's why those posts aren't filled. And because they're not getting filled, government is not hiring, not employing more doctors. And so we're qualifying for them staying at home. But with that picture, look at our our provider patient ratio. Mm. Um, we are about 0.79 doctors per thousand population. Mm. Very low mm. compared to other countries. Exactly. So 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 there were lots of problems. But those problems are not going to be resolved by the National Health Insurance. Now I want to make this very clear and I like that everybody that's that's criticizing this NHI bill agrees that universal health coverage is a non-negotiable. Mm. Everyone needs access to the type of health care they need, when they need it, where they need it. Do you need that with financial risk protection? Mm. There's no argument about that. The World Health Organization um, gets six body blocks of a health system. Mm. The first one is service delivery. Mm -hmm. You can't claim to have a system without service delivery. Without service delivery. The second one is your human resources for health, mm -hmm. which I've already said, we've got this... a great shortage mm -hmm. in this country. Third one is health information system. Mm -hmm. I spoke about how I wanted to pro project manage a, a, a project mm -hmm. to migrate data from paper files at Charlotte McGregor yeah. to, yeah. So it's something that is still not happening in most public health facilities in this country. In the city of Johannesburg, we actually made headway in implementing electronic health record mm. in the time that I was in MC. And after we were ousted, we were back to paper records. And For real? Yeah. Um, I'm on, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a blood pressure patient in yeah. the city. Yeah. And one day I went to... His Politics is giving you BP. Ah, I got diagnosed my first year. Yeah, MSP. for real. Yeah, you see, so now we, we, the political system is going to take you away, man. And listen, I don't have a medical aid. Yeah, I don't. Why don't you have a medical aid? I don't. So initially, it was you know when I entered politics, yeah. because I had to to downgrade my lifestyle so mm. much, and I've got kids, and, yeah. and I don't trust um, the government system with my children's education. Yeah. But I had to reprioritize, and my medical aid is one of the things I prior I I did away with. Is it? Yeah. Initially, that was the reason. Now, mm -hmm. it's just, I I haven't started the process. I keep saying, I'll do it, I'll do it. Yeah. I just haven't. And, and I think I got used to not having it for yeah. so long. So it, it seemed not urgent. But a lot of my colleagues are actually putting pressure on me to get it. So they make sense. Because I, I, also, I don't trust, you see, I've never been hospitalized. Yeah. And a lot of my colleagues say, if you get a hospital covered. Yeah. Uh, because with everything else, uh, and also because I'm a doctor, I suppose, and I have an, an, a good network of doctors, mm. easy for me to navigate and I'm yeah. able to survive without, yeah. without a medical aid. I but I think I think this is critical, you know, that you are actually commenting on this right now as somebody who is using yeah. the public health care system. You're using it. Yeah. So some of the criticisms have been that, no, people on, 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 on medical aid, they don't want to share net care, they don't want to share, but you actually say, look, I've worked in this system. I've led this system. I've created interventions for this system. And I'm currently using the system. And my information that was digital has now gone back onto paper. And it's a regression of point three yeah. of the SDGs yeah. of this particular yeah. objective. I got to the clinic one day and I didn't have I didn't have my file, I didn't have my card because normally I would just give them my finger. Yeah. And we had a biometric system. It worked beautifully. You had a biometric yes. So where where are the biometrics? No, they stopped it. So they are sitting. They stopped it. The machines and the whatnots. I don't just... know where they are now. So they were supposed to. So so they they failed to transition mm. because the contract that was in place elapsed. Oh. And by the time we were asked it, we were actually in the process of that transition. I see. Right? But we also we were looking at cost savings and mm. so on. So there was a lot of negotiation and we were comparing um, what would work best to mm. save money for the city. And they failed to manage because we were then asked and before that process yeah. was concluded. And, and, and this is the ugly part of politics. And I just want to just make this comment is that when you don't have good care, in any form of transition, interventions that were worthwhile, that were being done, just get thrown under the bus because 
it sounds so great that you should be able, with a touch of a fingerprint, all of your healthcare information is accessible to every practitioner who needs to help you at the point where they need to help you. That 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 is just so elegant, and the fact that it's now lost, yeah, is just something that I think we need to underline. Yeah. and I think it points out and it puts across that the remedies, some of the stuff you're talking about, can be done with the current budget mm. if the budget is better allocated. Better allocated, you get capable people to manage the system, manage the service, people with vision, people who know mm. what they're doing, people with the right network. Yeah. Um, I would never take credit for everything I introduced in the city. Um, yeah. I had the backing of academia. That's why I told you about the project yes. Health, where we have Vit University, UP, UK, yes. in one um, um urban poor facility that came and made it a, a, a world-class facility. And I'm seeing in your conversation the value of having a person who's trained in the field, who's worked in the field, who has these academic relationships, bringing people together to make interventions because it's not, it's, it's, it's scientific in its approach and methodology. Yeah. And I think it's, 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 it's refreshing to talk about this like this because even as you're speaking, I'm beginning to have ideas. I'm beginning to think, oh, this works. But I don't think that would have been possible without having a qualified, committed person on 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 the position of leadership to cater for this. Yeah. But we are on number three. You say there's six yeah. of them. So so you already touched on number six, which is leadership and governance. Oh, number six is leadership Important, and governance. Yeah. It's one of the most important building blocks of, yeah. of a health system. You can't run a health system without people who know what they're yeah. doing. And, and that is why if you prepare and contrast public and private, uh, people want to have a medical aid. People want yeah. to access um, private health care because they are well-managed, well-run. Um, that is why even providers, a lot of my colleagues that left, I talk to them, why did you leave government? Mm. Why are you in private? They all say we would go back if things worked. Yeah. If I knew that I have a theater list, I've got three spine cases today, everything is going to be in place, and there's not going to be issues and drama and excuses, mm -hmm. and I'll be able to say to my patient, I would go back. You know, mm. a lot of my colleagues say that. So we also see a loss of essential human resources for health mm. um, to the private sector, simply because that's better run. Mm. Um, and a lot of people think it's because of money. Yeah. And yes, of course, there's more money. It's more lucrative. It pays better. Mm -hmm. But there are people who are, who are genuinely passionate about public service. Uh, for somebody like me to specialize in public health yeah. medicine, when I could have done any other specialty, yeah. told you there are people who are passionate about public service. But often we are let down by the same system that we want to serve. And 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 so that's that's one of the building blocks. Then mm -hmm. you've got access to essential medicines mm -hmm. as another building block. This is number five, no yeah. four. Because I yeah. did six. Okay. So that's number four. Yeah. Um, access to essential medicines. Now, many times um, people visit clinics, hospitals, and they, they can't access the medicines that they need. Mm. Um, of course, again, there's disparities. There's some places that work better and, and so on, uh, but but those problems still still are still arise. The other one, of course, is um, that would be number. number. Well, we've done we've done five. We're left with the, the fifth one now. Okay. Because we've, one is, we've the done leadership, one finance, finance. Yeah. And this is where we come to the fund. Does it not provide the finance? Right. <laughs> At face value. Um, how much is this going to cost? Do you know? Well, I've looked. I, I did an independent calculation, right? Why because, did you have to do that? Because the, the socioeconomic impact assessment did not have a number. And, but they had, I could, I could extrapolate it, right? Uh, um, basic business mathematics, basically. Because they said, the current expenditure of on healthcare is 8.9% of the GDP. The 2024 GDP is about 7 trillion. So that takes you to 660 million, uh, sorry, billion. Then they said 49% of that goes to um, the private healthcare and the other 51 goes to um, public healthcare. So that takes it to about 330 on each side, a little bit more on, on the public health care. So then they said this is insufficient because the the 330 on one side is is for 40 it's it's for 16% of the population. And the other 330 is for 
84. It's for 84 percent. So then I said, okay, based on this calculation, how much does it cost to fully cover the whole population at the same quality that you're covering for the 16 percent? That number scared me, right? Because I got 1.9 trillion. But then some of the other estimates and articles I saw by Adrian Gore said that they're estimating about 500 billion to be the cost. The current uh, budget this year was 271 billion for healthcare, close to 272, right? So those are the numbers that I saw, but I saw that the government documents in and of themselves did not have a costing. Yeah. And I thought that was peculiar because typically yeah. you want to have a costing for a, a big legislation like this. feasibility. I mean, yeah. how do you know that something is implementable if you don't know what it's going to cost and you're not sure you'll be able to raise yeah. um, the funds? And a lot of the criticism is precisely that, um, that, you know, we, we're talking about raising taxes. Can we really do it? Is it doable? Is yeah. it affordable? Is it implementable? Is it workable? Is it? Mm. And a lot of the criticism is that it's actually not implementable. And that's why I'll call it a scam mm. because at face value, it looks like this wonder, you know, pill. Mm. But actually, it's not. It's far from it. Um, there's a lot of work that needed to be done that was not done. Mm. Um, there was a lot of feedback from sober minds um, across South Africa. So what was your feedback when you were in that public uh, participation process? Gosh, I don't remember, but I mean, I, I know what's wrong with, yeah. with the NHI. I don't even remember what I said. Yeah. Uh, but I would have raised a lot of the issues that I'm raising. Mm. And the fact that the, the ANC government cannot be trusted to yeah. implement anything. You don't need a separate fund. I mean, the mm. DA has has raised those um, points that we don't need another state-owned enterprise that's only going to be new to us because mm. they're not doing well. Why start another one and, and why put healthcare at risk? And it's now mm. people's lives that we're talking about. Um, we don't have capacity to implement this or the current government doesn't have. Mm. Potentially a different government could, but I, I think they would change the model. They would mm. go with the entire model. They would just look at how to implement universal health coverage, mm. which I think the Working Cape has done well and mm. um, yes, there are challenges in the Western Cape as well because they're still subject to um, fiscal constraints. And yes, we're talking financing and um, healthcare financing is expensive. Even in public service, there's never enough. Um, particularly, I know when I did job, we had a huge challenge. As, mm. I, I spoke earlier about undocumented migrants mm. and how we have to cater for them because we don't, then we're all at risk. And however, they're not counted when then our budgets are, the budgets are decided on. Yeah. So we're always underfunded and we have to render the service. So you always, um, you know, you, you've got constraints all the time. Mm. So, so we do need to think Think about how to to improve that, but when you look at financing, you don't just look at increasing what's coming in. You also look at where you're losing, right? Mm. You look at waste, you look at leaks, and corruption is one an area where you need mm. some um, serious attention. If you look at what happened with the COVID nineteen relief fund, mm. um, a lot of people worried that you know there, there were. Uh, I mean, I know in Job we were sitting with SIU reports. And nothing was done. Mm. You know, um, those those cases were not progressed, and people mm. are still in their jobs today. Uh, we, you know about it. I, I don't yeah, know there's a lot. There's a lot that right. was reported. Yeah. So, so you need to deal with those things because you can't complain that the money is not enough and that mm. you're not managing waste. Yeah. The other thing also, though, I remember when I was in MDC, um, we had um, a, a provincial health council meeting that was cancelled, maybe two. Because the sheriff had come and taken the furniture from the provincial department of health. Get out! I promise you, and it was because of um, debt, some some debt. Mm. Um, I know that when I was mayor, some of the, the departments that owed us money were uh, housing help was one of them. Yeah, you know, we had a lot of housing departments that owed the city money, yeah. for water and electricity and so on. So, um, so you need to look at those things, but. I'm um, talking about what happened then when, mm. when Dr. Gwen was in the C. I I remember one of the things she complained about was medical negligence mm. litigation that was sucking the healthcare budget. Mm. And and she was saying that we need a solution. And at the time she was thinking of a fund similar to the road accident fund, mm. that there needs to be a better way to manage mm. uh, me medical ne negligence claims so they don't tap into the healthcare budget. Mm. Um, that problem has been there for long. Nobody has resolved it. Are we having higher levels of medical negligence Whoa. than 
you know, other case studies or benchmarks? We are having, it's become a whole industry, it's a whole economy. Yeah. I mean, I know of doctors who've gone and studied law because they see the opportunity. Yeah. They want to make money. There's a lot of, you know, there's also a lot of bogus cases mm. and, and so on. But it's a problem. And yes, it's taking a lot of their healthcare budget, but there's ways to resolve it. I've actually mm. chatting to um, um, and being a practitioner with great experience in the healthcare space about what is the law saying? Because mm. I'm in private healthcare now. I've got medical insurance. I, I, you have to have indemnity. So mm. you can't work in a private hospital if you're not insured. Mm. Right? It's a prerequisite. Yeah. Because the hospital will not take liability mm. should you mess up. Mm. If they won't, they don't get mm. it. Why should the states be held liable when professionals mess up? The same mm. professionals who, as soon as they get to private health, they have to get that got, same insurance. So why can't we look at a different model? I like that. That's a good idea. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So there are so many things we can consider that we're not considering. Yeah. And and we're going and and putting in place something that's quite that quite frankly is not implementable. You know, all sober minds have said um, checks and balances are not in place, and the the public participation. Process mm. botched, and a lot of people raised concerns. Yeah, those were not addressed, not addressed, not reflected also in the nothing, final. Nothing, they were just ignored. Yeah, you know, and, the, and that's why you hear the Democratic Alliance saying we're going to court because the public participation process were not followed through correctly. Yeah, so there, there's just so many issues with, with the national health insurance, but everybody agrees we need universal health coverage. Yeah, I believe we've got pockets of excellence, we've got what works in the Western Cape. Let's look at it, that's a good place to start. Mm. Or having fruit, the same finances are a problem. Let's look at where the leaks are. Mm. Let's deal with medical medical negligence claims. Mm. Let's deal with corruption. You know, uh, and so on. So we'll start with yeah. with what is doable. Technology right? as well. So, so let me ask you. We're out of time. Let me ask: Is there a real risk that this will push out medical practitioners to other uh, territories? Was huge. Yeah. Why? Huge risk. But firstly, there's uncertainty. There's a lot of unanswered questions. And I felt it. I felt it the yeah. day the bill was signed. You yeah. know, I've just entered private health care yeah. itself, right? And and I found myself asking myself that question, you know, do I need to reposition myself? Do I, do you know what I mean? And a part of me knows it's not going to be implemented because that's not implementable. Yeah. But a part of me doesn't like the uncertainty. It's yeah. unnerving. So I would rather move to a place where I can have some security as I build or establish mm. myself. And I think that's what will potentially happen to a lot of um, providers. Yeah. Um, we'll see people move into other spaces. We'll see people move out of the country. Mm. You know that Canada has always been attractive to South African doctors, mm. Australia as well. So we could potentially see moves out of the country. Um, I know a lot of people were thinking about it before. Mm. The bill was signed. Do you know a lot of doctors who have moved um, from your your med school days and your other practice days? You know, days. we spoke about it a lot. Yeah, yeah. I know that when I was in uh, when I was doing public health, we used to speak about it a lot. I mean, we even looked at what you would need to yeah. move to another country. So you need to write um, exams to mm. qualify to operate. I know we were looking at the US. Um, yeah, right to US MLEs. So we did all the research. Yeah, because well, for us at the time, it was um, with public health. It was just the the lack of career planning. Mm. For public health medicine, it's mm. poorly understood. It's poorly um, stewarded. Nobody's mm -hmm. advocating for public health practitioners to have positions that state yeah. this for a public health practitioner. So, yeah. And I remember that we tried to engage the minister at the time. So we were mm. frustrated. And, we and that's also something that also needs to be done because yeah. you do need public health practitioners to fix the of public course. health system and to do the integration you were talking about earlier. Yeah. Well, in Gauteng, fortunately, a lot of us now are in um, in strategic uh, position mm. in, in in the provincial health department, national health, mm. and so on. So I'm seeing an improvement. Yeah. But I I do know that at the time we were frustrated. We felt we're not seen. We're ignored. Nobody knows who we are. The value we can bring. We weren't looking at mm. and, and we were actively researching what we needed to do to to move out of South Africa. Yeah. You know what? I I dropped out of medical school, but uh, I'm still in touch with some of my colleagues from that time, and a few of them are overseas. Um. I think one guy I saw his Instagram is in Italy and he was celebrating his birthday with Italians and dancing and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, I'm seeing a lot more 
of these guys now um, exercising the option to move. And this was before the NHI got signed, because NHI got signed this week. So I think it is a legitimate concern and one that we have to think about because in the UK, doctors are leaving practice and some of them are leaving the country to go to other places. And as they open up vacancies there, obviously the UK then will be looking for doctors elsewhere and they have a very aggressive program. So I do think it's a real risk. But we're out of time, guys. I hope this conversation helped. Um, Dr. Mpo Palate has a wealth of knowledge. She's been an MMC. She's been the mayor of Johannesburg. She, as you can tell uh, from her account, she's worked in the private healthcare sector, in the public healthcare sector. She's done the public health. She's worked at Alex Clinic, so many other spaces. So I think her contributions to this have been um, apt, relevant, and very important for anyone who's thinking about how the NHI affects them. Till the next one, peace.